people don't realize data is not a philosophy. Data is just the result of a philosophy, the result of whatever thought mindset, thought process, a mechanical change, adjustment that you're making. It's just producing those results. Hello and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. I am Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for being here. This episode is brought to you by Baseball Cloud. Baseball Cloud's revolutionary software platform brings to life the numbers captured by TrackMan and FlightScope. This provides colleges, players, and facility owners around the world a turnkey product, allowing them to analyze their data using key metrics and custom visualizations on one intuitive user interface. Go to BaseballCloud.com to find out how you can have your own data analytics department for your program. Data has a story to tell, and Baseball Cloud gives it a voice. During this episode, I get the pleasure of interviewing our longtime sponsor, Kevin Davidson, CEO of Baseball Cloud. And on the show, KD discusses how Baseball Cloud was developed, the problems that it solves, and how data in baseball is not only beneficial, but he also shares the ways in which the game has embraced it. I can't thank Kevin and the Baseball Cloud team enough for their longtime support. And here is Kevin Davidson. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, John. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And I couldn't be more thankful to get you on. And, and I'm always thankful for your partnership and, and allowing some freedom with the podcast. And, and hopefully you have seen it be a mutual benefit to you as well. And I'm so thankful to have you know teamed up with you guys, I think probably almost a year ago now, but it's been an awesome partnership so far. And, and it's really been really cool to see how far Baseball Cloud has grown and just you know, the past year or so. Yeah, it's, it's it definitely has been a mutual partnership. I can't tell you, I probably have had three or four clubs, major league clubs, actually, uh, some guys in their data analytics department, actually, when they reached out to me, uh, tell me they first heard about me on the uh, head of the curve. Oh, cool. So I thought, I'm like, wow, man, this is, John's doing real well with the show. So it's been, uh, it's definitely been good for us and uh, we appreciate and we're thankful to be a part of it. Of course, of course. Well, that's very flattering. And if, you know, obviously you can't tell through the microphone, but maybe blushing a little bit because that's pretty cool to hear. But <laughs> I, I would love to hear a little bit about yeah. your, your background and how you decided to, you know, get into Baseball Cloud. And you've had an array of, of experiences and it's, you know, you're not coming from completely outside of the game, but you played, you coached, then you kind of, you know, you went a, a financial advisor route. But just tell us all about that. Yeah, I'm not your prototypical data guy, that's for sure. You know, I don't I'm not uh I'm not the guy that has all this experience or knows how to code or knows how, anything about engineering and mm-hmm. knows uh what about what a good launch angle or any of that stuff is, but you know, I'm I'm a 5 foot 8 guy that got drafted in the 28th round, so typically for me you, you wouldn't have thought data would apply. When I got done playing, I I coached in a college summer with that league, the Florida Cleveland Summer League. And along the way, I got a chance to get to know Wes Johnson very well when he was over at DBU. Danny Fitzgerald is a good friend, and he went over there and he said, Katie, you got to meet this guy, Wes Johnson. He's going to be a big league pitching coach one day. And I'm like, okay, you know, I've, I've heard that before. I get to know Wes and learn that he's on a whole nother atmosphere than everybody else. And, and during this time, I'm a financial advisor, and I represent, you know, a bunch of major league players, and I'm kind of going that route, so I'm still in the game. But one day, I'm I'm sitting there talking to Jose Batista, and who's one of our one of my guys, and Along the way, I'm, I'm kind of seeing how this data is really affecting him in this contract. So I started listening and listening, and I pick up the phone one day and I call Wes Johnson. I said, "Wes, you gotta you gotta explain this data stuff to me, man. I got I gotta buy into it a little bit because it's dictating my career." So Wes starts talking to me and and showing me some data, and he shows me you know tons and tons of Excel files that I'm sure everybody out there that's dealt with data is fully aware of. And I'm like, Wes, this is not what I'm talking about. I said, I'm, I need to know the data. And I he said, Kev, this is the data. And I said, well, Wes, what about the charts and the graphs? He goes, Katie, that's that's like software. This is the actual data. Mm-hmm. And I, I truly legitimately said, what is the difference? And he goes, oh, man. He goes, okay, <laughs> the data gets put out, and it comes out on this software file. Me and a grad assistant spend about 30 to 40 hours a week filtering through this data bringing it together. And he told me he puts it on a, a software called Tableau, which I've never heard of. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, th- this is really inefficient. So I, I hang up the phone with him and I 
crawl around and I start doing some research and I call up and, and I saw the, the back end systems of, of a few major league clubs that were generous enough to let me see them and understand how this worked. So I call up West back. I call West. I go, West. what if I created a centralized software system that takes all this data from all these different sources and automates it, filters it, consolidates it, and turns it into visuals? Would that be something that you could use at your at college, at DBU, or at the time, I'm sorry, he was at Mississippi State? Mm-hmm. And he goes, and Wes has this kind of Southern accent, he goes, oh, KD, if you came up with that, you'd be a billionaire <laughs> with a B. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget that I was driving to work that day and I said, well, Wes, I'm, I'm going to do it. He goes, okay, I'd love to be a part of it with you. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, uh, the evolution of baseball cloud was, was formed. And, uh, you know, Wes was very helpful to me early on in the process. And then he got big time and got the Minnesota twins uh, pitching coach job. So mm-hmm. his accessibility kind of diminished a little bit, but he's always been there with me. And I, I, I pick his brain on several different ideas, but, but essentially, I, I owe Wes Johnson uh, the core credit for the evolution of baseball cloud. Well, and, and you know, obviously, Wes is, has been ahead of the game for what feels like a decade and an awesome guy, awesome person, awesome coach, which I think you we can all see the benefits that hiring him has made throughout the entire twin system. And, and that's awesome. I, I love hearing that. And I, I'm sure launching and just having an idea is not that was not easy, an easy thing to do at all. No, it wasn't, especially for me who, who knows nothing about data and who knows nothing about technology. And I didn't believe in it, so to speak, as I was hearing about it from the outside. You know, I'm more of an old school mind. I was really, I'm a converted guy, mm-hmm. but I always, I tell Eugene Bleeker from, from 108 all the time. I said, I blame the disconnect between old school and new school on the, the selling of it by the new school guys sure. is the, the new school guys do a poor job of selling really what data is. Mm -hmm. And it's partly the problem of social media. You only get a a couple little, you know, you get a, what is it? 142 characters to to describe what you're talking about. So I think a lot of people just see that and they kind of get turned off. And what's funny is they think data is a philosophy. (laughs) And you you gotta, people don't realize data is not a philosophy. Data is just the result of a philosophy. You know, it's just the, the, the result of whatever thought mindset, thought process, a mechanical change, adjustment that you're making. It's just producing those results. And, and, and really, these, these old school guys think that there's some data analytics nerd sitting there in a batting cage while Bryce Harper's you know, hitting in a, in a cage saying, no, Bryce, you got you to gotta change your launch angle two degrees on that one for it to be better. <laughs> it is not that. They basically just go back and just back in backdate the data and said, which set of data produces the most optimal results? Mm -hmm. That's all it's it's really happening. And that's where data becomes valuable. Once you understand, hey, what did I do to create that result? What did I think about creating that result? And it doesn't mean necessarily, you know, changing your swing to hit a ball 110 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about how to increase your your max exit velocity, but also not compromising your average exit velocity. Mm -hmm. And, and it's about using it to find that balance and find that optimal kind of uh, stage in, in, your, in your performance to, to utilize as you move forward. And, and it's really as simple as that. No, definitely. And, uh, you know, I, I think that we're, we're seeing a shift between what used to be two different sides, and hopefully they're coming closer and closer together. And, and I think that, you know, I, the more I talk to guys who have adopted some data, it's, it's more on the side of, okay, now I finally have some different things that instead of it being just my opinion, now I can prove it. And these are the things that are going to help me or help the player move forward rather than completely placing a number on a player and saying, this is the absolute thing without ever seeing them play. And I don't know if you've seen that, but I I do see it coming a little bit closer than say like five years ago or so. Oh, I, I actually don't think baseball gets enough credit for how fast it's adopted the integration of data. I've had to do a lot of research on data integration into into the corporate world, mm-hmm. and and corporate America is very very slow adapting to data. Fortune 500 companies are very very slow adapting to data, but all in all, when you look back and see how data is is being applied, and you see how the passion that these guys that you see on social media that we all know that how passionate they are about utilizing and, and advancing the game of baseball, it's actually moving at a very very quick rate. 
you know, I, I think a lot of people, you're certainly seeing people use it poorly. I certainly think you're seeing major league organizations use it poorly. I see major league organizations using it like ways that I've never even fathomed to mm-hmm. use it. They're a lot smarter than you think, but at the same time, they're also kind of tiptoeing into this. You know, some organizations that we've, we've seen, you know, they just went all in and they weren't afraid to throw things against the wall and see what stick, mm-hmm. see what stuck and, and kind of run with that. And, and ultimately the, the clubs are, are doing that. I'm hoping that baseball cloud is, is that next wave of what I feel is the next wave of data integration. And that's integrating the players with their data. Mm-hmm. You know, I think so many people were hesitant, rightfully so to integrate players with it, because I think the clubs, the colleges, the coaches had to figure it out first before they included the players into it. You know, you don't want to all of a sudden start integrating data and then bring the players in and start going over with them. And they're asking you, what does it mean? And you really only have about two weeks uh, of experience of capturing data. Sure. So I think the next wave of it, which is where baseball cloud has seen the, the growth and the focus, which is starting to integrate the players a little bit more, starting to use analytics for the colleges out there that, that have a track man, flight scope, Yakker tech, you know, the game capturing systems. And as we start integrating the different forms of, of data on top of that, the, the rep sotos, the diamond kinetics, the edutronic cameras, the blast motions, synergy cameras. Those are all things that we're working on now for, you know, baseball cloud 2.0, because we want all the data to be integrated together to tell that full story. Mm-hmm. Data is just like everything else in life. You need to hear the, the full story to, to be able to tell the story of your end result. So mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to do at, at baseball cloud. Oh, that's great. And so let's rewind just a little bit because I, I'm really curious about your team and let's talk uh, about them. And so you come up with this great idea or you and Wes come up with this great idea and you're deciding to run with it, but you have no ability to code and, and you're very, as you mentioned <laughs> earlier, you, you don't know much about data at all. So what was your process in finding the right fit and the right team to be able to promote what you're trying to accomplish here? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. And my team is, is the reason why I'm, I'm here. When I had the idea, I, I called the guy that, that I know by the name of uh, Bruce Quinn. Bruce is kind of a life mentor for me. And he's built and sold several technology companies for several hundreds of millions of dollars. And I called him and I you know, gave him my idea. And he asked me, who is going to be my tech guy? And I said, Bruce, I haven't really thought about that yet, but I'll figure, I'll, I'll figure it out. It's, it's not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Kev, Kev, here's what you need to do. You need to go find out the, the best and the baddest engineer coder on the planet to put this together. And you need to put him on your team and you need to give him ownership of your company. And I said, you know, that's a little much. Don't you think? I mean, I'm thinking about just outsourcing it or finding a headhunting firm or something to, to help me put this together. He said, Kev, the, the analogy I'll give you, it's, it's like having a, a car dealership and outsourcing all your mechanical work. Mm-hmm. He goes, you're going to get killed. If you don't know what you're doing, you're going to take a path that's going to, it's going to take you down a deep hole. I said, okay, now, now I got to rethink this. So I call up uh, the smartest kid I know, a guy named Corey Whiting. And uh, Corey is a guy that I've known for 10, 12 years. He played baseball at Rollins College where I played. He was uh, an engineer with stats up in Chicago. He worked very extensively on, on their coding of in the when they were working with the NBA to track player and ball movement up and down the court, you know, he was, he was a pioneer and one of the guys responsible for that project. And I called him and at the time he was making very, very good money with a company called team snap. He's one of their lead engineers there. And I said, Corey, here's my idea. What do you think? And we met at a, at a Einstein's bagel shop Mm -hmm. and we sat there and talked for two hours. And, you know, Corey's a very critical guy. And I'm, I was very reluctant to, are very excited, I should say, to see his response, but nervous at the same time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he listened to it and he embraced it and he thought it was a great idea. And then the next morning he called me up and he said, hey, let's do this. I said, well, what do you mean let's do this? He goes, let's do this. I'm in. There you go. And he was going to, he quit, decided to quit Team Snap. We became partners and uh, did a joint venture. And he's responsible for the, for the entire coding and engineering of the project. He's a former baseball player you know, a great baseball player at that. Uh, not very often do you see uh, two partners. One of them has better baseball stats than the other. And that <laughs> the one with the better stats was the, is your engineer, not your CEO or sales guy. Awesome. Um, and, and, you know, Corey, he ended up playing independent ball for a year, but he's not your typical engineer. He has a very love and a very strong love and passion for the game of baseball. So 
it really makes our communication a lot easier than dealing with somebody that doesn't have knowledge of the game. And it's really allowed us to really accelerate baseball cloud and to get to the hands of uh, the appropriate market. And he's just now uh, getting rolling with our 2.0 product. And it's awesome. I mean, he's, he's my secret weapon. He, he really is. He's the key to this whole thing. I always tell him, you, you build what we need to have and, and I'll sell it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what, that's what, that's what he's doing. No, oh, absolutely. And obviously you can tell you're passionate for what you guys are doing and that's all the time. And, and, you know, the excitement that you, that our listeners are hearing right now and that you're putting off, that's you all the time. Like you are so like every time I've met you, <laughs> and every time I've been around you, every time I've talked to you, this has just been, uh, you know, you're so excited about the product. And, and I mean, obviously it's, you know, you guys are doing a great job and, and it's filling a need in the game because just for, for me as an example, and this is a very small sample size of what I'm sure a lot of teams have run into. So we get the flight scope in the fall and this is right before the baseball cloud website and just being able to upload it and getting the reports back literally within 24 hours. So for those of that don't use, you know, the very much data or tech. So we get the flight scope and what you get is a, a CSV file with just all of these different <laughs> metrics and all of these different numbers. And to be honest, it, I'm sure you've seen it. It is extremely overwhelming. And all I'm thinking about is, oh my gosh, what, how do people turn this into these really pretty reports that you get? And so we did that for a little while this fall. And I picked out a couple of different numbers that we wanted to track. And then the website came up. I started uploading all of that stuff. And again, within 24 hours, we get back this beautiful report on with spray charts and hot zones and exit velocity with launch angle and obviously release point and spin rates. And I mean, it's just beautiful. And it was so fast. And I'll, I'll tell you what, it it is going to make a whole lot of lives easier when people understand, I guess, when people understand how long it takes in the first place, and then how great it is to be able to send it to an awesome company like Baseball Cloud and, and get those reports back that's just like one page of everything that you requested in the first place. It's it's amazing. And I, again, I, if I hadn't have gone through the first part of struggling through trying to read all of that with the CSV file, I wouldn't have an appreciation for what what you guys <laughs> put out. And, and, I, and I've put a couple of out on social media, and when this one airs, I'll, I'll have to you know, blur out some names, but send out some reports and just to show what those look like as well. Yeah. I, I kind of knew we were onto something when I, once I realized and I started doing some research on this and I saw how many at the time when I started this about just over two years ago, when I saw how many track man units that were out there and mm-hmm. I saw the penetration flight scope was using, how many people were still spending all this money to get this information and all they were getting was these Excel files. Right. So I said, these people must really, really want to find some information or find some value within this information. If they're going to go through the all this work, you know, similar to West, 30 to 40 hours a week That's to a do this, that if they're going to do this and get an Excel file, you know, hey, I'm I'm a passionate person. I, I love this stuff. But that's a lot. That's a little bit too much work for me to want to go out and buy a unit and do all this work to find this information there. So it shows you the the power that's within this information that that people were still willing to go out and accelerate the data capturing at their programs or their high schools or mm-hmm. in the minor leagues that if they didn't have to to do all this work if this information was just automated and and put on a something that was very visually appealing something that they didn't have to do any work to dissect the information and find some unlocked gems inside here i knew that if we just put together some some quality visuals and and allow the data to interact with each other and tell the story, we were going to be on, on, on the right path. And, and so far, so good. For sure. And, you know, something that we talked about and have talked about a couple of times just in our regular everyday conversations is, is how teams are using data. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to have it and it's one thing to collect it. And it's another thing completely to be able to use that information to make your players better. And I think that, that that's where the money is right now. I think you know everyone is familiar with the flight scopes and the track mans and you know going to baseball savant and seeing all of this different stuff. But it's another thing to be able to use that in a way that helps with player development. So just what what is your advice for especially amateur teams who don't have an entire staff that is dedicated to data collection and crunching the numbers and doing all of this stuff? What's your best advice on some different metrics that you have seen that have been useful and just some different ways that you've seen teams using that. And again, just to be able to help make their players better. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's quite simple to be honest with you. And it's, I think it's 
one of the things that we really take a lot of pride in is is our database of data. Mm-hmm. I, I think we have one of the largest databases of amateur data in the United States, just simply because we get all this data flowing in from so many different sources. Sure. And we have such a historical context with a lot of this, where we have data going back, you know, five, six years of game data on all these different clubs and different devices that are coming in. And it's simply just kind of as you're capturing data on your players is seeing the data that, that represent their, their performance and kind of go back and see historically where success has been found with that kind of data. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the, one of the ones I use in a simple analogy is we've gone in and put in a database and, and we have hundreds of thousands of, of pitches thrown from various levels of baseball and, and using one of, you know, vertical movement of eight inches or less, for example. And that's, simply something that you can consider a high spin rate, just mm-hmm. very, in a very simplified form. Well, where do you get the most swing and misses on a fastball with eight inches vertical break or less? Mm-hmm. Well, it's the upper third, just above the zone of the strike zone. Well, I probably, I think it's like 92% of swing and misses on fastballs with those qualities are swing and misses at the upper third part of the zone. Right. Well, the hardest hit balls for that type of spin rate. Well, that's middle middle down. Well, don't throw that fastball, middle, middle down, throw that fastball, upper third, anywhere in middle or out. Mm -hmm. As long as in the strike zone, that's where you're going to get your swing and misses. And and when you break it down, something like that, it's pretty simple. There's a story of Tony Singrani getting traded over to the Dodgers. And Tony was, I believe he came over from the Reds at the time was who it was. And the Dodgers software, similar to, well, a little bit more advanced, a lot more advanced, I should say, than baseball cloud at the time. They just identified that his swing and misses were really abnormally high in a certain part of the zone on his fastball and abnormally high on a slider, just middle down. So he gets traded over and they bring him in the office and the, the story is told that he, he was a little nervous on applying all this data. Mm-hmm. And they just asked him, is there a reason why you only throw your fastball there, you know, 15% of the time and your slider here? 20% of the time, whatever that number was. And he said, no, that's just what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And they just said, hey, we want you to increase that, you know, 50% here, 50% here, you know, whatever that, that number was, and, and let's see what happens. And he did that, and the rest the rest was history for him that, that rest of that year. I think he had a, a sub one and a half ERA, which mm-hmm. prior to that, he never had lower than a, a four ERA or in the big league. And simply just making those adjustments allowed him to optimize his success. He didn't create any new pitch. He didn't worry about what where his fingers were on his on his fastball or where his fingers were on a slider. He didn't worry about any any kind of uh, spin rate or, or anything of that nature. He just threw where he was having the most success. And I think that's that's a very very easy solution for guys that are going out there trying to increase performance via data. But then at the same time, you can go out there and and find some characteristics of your pitch and and identify what other pitches you can add to your repertoire that can complement those. If, if you're a sinker slider guy, you know, you, ne- you don't need to be working on a 12 to six curveball. Mm-hmm. Just work on something that does the opposite. And, you know, uh, a new phrase now is, is pitch tunneling and being able to do that, find that, that consistent release point and, and something that we identify at baseball cloud and throw a, a slider off that same release point and use baseball cloud to identify how consistently you're throwing that ball from the same release point. No, and, and it's really as simple as that. For sure, for sure. And I, I think that, you know, I, I don't know specifically, but they talked about Mike Trout having trouble with the up and in pitch. And I'm sure he got tired of hearing about it being the best player in the world that he is. And now he just doesn't swing at it. And it's it's really interesting to see that. And, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it's it's you may that may be a suggestion and that may be a guess. But now it's just confirmed with uh, the different heat zones and, you know, obviously the what his what his swing and miss is there and what his exit velocity is there and, and all of that. And and now, so you're taking a lot of the guesswork out of it, essentially. Correct. And and that's the thing. You have you have a couple of different routes you can take with it is you can identify where your weak points are and identify where your hot points are. And you could either, A, just dominate the hot points and, mm-hmm. and do your best on working on pitch selection and, and hitting and swinging at those pitches. Or B, go out there and, and work on improving that weak point and, and make sure that your holes aren't aren't as big. That's not for me to decide or you to decide. That's for the player to decide or that individual coach to decide is how weak is that weak point mm-hmm. and, and how much do you want to allow that weak spot to become something that is, is a playable trait. And that's for the player. I mean, I think everybody thinks that 
increasing your exit velocity or getting a leg kick or any kind of change is all about maximizing the speed at which you hit the ball. Yeah. It's, if you make a swing change and your peak exit velocity goes from 105 to 115, that's great. But if it takes your average exit velocity from 88 to 75, that's not great. So you got to determine what's the give and the take. What do you want to apply and bring to bring to the ballpark every day, especially when you step in that batter's box, it's trying to find that blend and, and that, that mindset is to reach optimal performance. And and only the players and the guys on the field with that player at that time can identify that Mm -hmm. it's not anybody else's place to tell them which one's right or wrong. It's for them to go back and say, Hey, which one works best for me? And you've been around a lot of professional clubs. And and the reason that I bring that up is because they have the most technology available for the players, at least most clubs anyways. Have you seen that the players were fairly intellectually curious onto what their data was? And I mean, what would the percentage be? And, and just talk to us a little bit about that too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we have a facility here in Orlando, Florida, and we have a number of players that come back and train in the off season. Having a facility is really not part of what we do. It's just kind of, uh, we're very fortunate to have a location that we, you know, allow the players to come in and train. And 95% of the players that we talk to are not being told anything about their data. Mm-hmm. And it, it also frustrates them to some extent. Even major league players, for that matter, are being told, uh, are not being having their data shared with them. And for us, yeah, we've been traveling the country. We've met with, you know, over 25 major league clubs over the last, you know, year and a half. And quite honestly, there's only three clubs and, and one of them really, really dominant predominantly is doing it, but there's only three clubs that are truly sharing the data with the players as part of the player development process, mm-hmm. which that still has me scratching my head a little bit, but going back to what I said earlier, it's, I think a lot of people are, you know, I'm not going to go out there and bash them for that. Mm-hmm. I think they're all trying to figure out what to do, but it, it kind of ties into, in, in my opinion, what I've seen is really the back end software system. Mm-hmm. Most of these uh, major league clubs have built a very, very, very robust system to identify and interpret all this data, but they're using it for, you know, analytics and trades and, and decision making ability for creating a lineup or determining how much a player's worth, to determining who they want to go out and get a get via a trade or free agency. But they're they're still not integrating the players with that, which Hopefully, I think is I'm betting on that changing, obviously, with the creation of Baseball Cloud. But the a lot of the problem is, is that this system that they built is designed to be seen by the organization and the front office staff and the player development staff. Mm-hmm. It's almost as if, you know, the, the three that are using it with the players, for the most part, they've almost built their own individual system that allows the players to access it, just so the players aren't seeing the scouting reports, the the injury notes or the coach's remarks or the manager's remarks. So it's kind of uh, they're kind of in that uh, gray area right now. So that's where we're seeing major league clubs reach out to us to say, Hey, we want to include our players with the data. How do we do so? Mm-hmm. And, and that's why we've spent really the last six months onboarding new data capturing companies and platforms, i.e. Yakrotech, i.e. Diamond Kinetics. Mm-hmm. We're working with a couple of force plate companies now, and then as well as just tying the video to, to the data. So I think the next wave, I, the, the players want to want to see it. I think that argument of this is too much information or we're going to overwhelm the players with this stuff as a fear. You know, keep, these kids are smart nowadays. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, my son, who's five years old, knows how to use an iPad better than I do right now. <laughs> so the point is to simplify this information to make it more useful or practical for a player to use. It's not mm-hmm. it's not something that's that has to be a physics formula. Sure. It's, it's pretty simple. Sure. And I'm sure that the longer this goes on and, and the more these kids that have grown up with this, the, the more that they want to see that stuff. And I get both sides. I get that you don't want paralysis by analysis and them looking at literally every single number that they've got. But I also get from the player standpoint of they have a couple things that have helped them, whether or not in college or high school potentially. And, and they want to be able to see that and track that over time. And obviously that that's their numbers too, which are owned by the team. But but anyways, no, it's, that's a really interesting conversation and, and one that, that I will be intrigued to see where that goes in the next couple of years. But, you know, Kevin, I, I really appreciate your time today. And we've talked a ton about, you know, Baseball Cloud and what it's going to do and how it's changing the game. And, you know, I just want to open it up for you. Well, actually, let me let me ask you, where can our listeners get in touch with you if they want more information about how to get involved with Baseball Cloud? Yeah, you can go to BaseballCloud.com where we're actually launching our, our new website. 
here in, in, in about a week or so. Okay. So hopefully by the time this, this show is aired, our, our new website will be, will be up. We kind of halted all new colleges on the system over the last two months. We just opened it up July 15th for new colleges to onboard with the platform. We really had to make sure that we can handle all the customers that we were going to bring on. And right now we've kind of got all of our ducks in a row and we're ready to, to take on new schools. I think as of right now, we have 70, 72 colleges that are going to be baseball cloud teams this year. There's still about 45 other ones out there with a track man, flight school, be Acrotech that we have not, we have not brought on board. Hopefully we'll get those, those schools sooner, soon enough. But if you go to baseballcloud.com, we'll have uh, and reach out to us via our website. We'll be more than happy to give you a live demo and, and show you uh, Baseball Cloud 2.0 and, and get you guys locked and loaded. Well, perfect. Well, you know, I just want to open up the mic for you. And, and I, I really do. I want to encourage anyone who is trying to do, do all of that stuff themselves to at least reach out and see what you know, Baseball Cloud can do for you. Because I know that it took a ton of hours off of my plate. And, and it's something that you can't you can't <laughs> buy back time for sure. But Kevin, is there anything else that you'd like to tell our listeners before you go? No, I mean, I, uh, the only thing I tell them is, is uh, you know, all you old school guys out there, don't don't be overwhelmed by the data, but, and and don't be intimidated by it. Don't fight it. I've done a lot of research on this. It's data is is a very very valuable tool, and once you understand that, whatever approach or whatever technique or, or mindset you try to instill in your players is being able to go back and utilize the data to say, hey. You know, when I when I gave this hitter this visual cue or this verbal cue, his numbers went up. And it doesn't mean he went from hitting a ball 98 miles an hour to 102 necessarily. It, maybe it helped him create create more barrels on the ball. Maybe it allowed his average exit velocity to to go up. Maybe it allowed him to hit a ball just as hard to the right side of the field as it does as it does the left side of the field. I mean, the data is your friend. Just always remember that that data is a philo- is not a philosophy. Okay, it's 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 the result of the philosophy you are teaching that hitter, and when you embrace that, you you will be surprised at, at the way that data will change your life and change the way you identify players. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which could include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.